Hey everyone and welcome back. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy in these very bizarre times. So I've covered a lot of strange cases and stories on this channel. It's kind of built into the fabric of my content. But today's story is one of the most bizarre ones I've ever covered, at least in my opinion. I'm not even sure how to categorize it. It starts out as a history slash archaeology story and then takes a really bizarre turn partway through. Either way, I'm kind of surprised more people aren't talking about it. Let's talk about the woman only known as the Persian Princess. The story of the Persian princess likely begins in the fall of 2000. Police in Karachi in southern Pakistan were investigating a murder. During their investigation, they questioned a man named Ali Akbar. Akbar showed them a video of a mummy that was being sold on the black market. Police were able to trace the mummy to Quetta, a town about 420 miles away from Karachi in northern Pakistan. It's still not clear just how the mummy ended up on the opposite end of the country. On October 19, 2000, police in Quetta raided the home of a local tribe leader and camel breeder named Sardar Wali Riki. It was here that they found the mummy. It had allegedly first been discovered by an Iranian named Sharif Shah Baki after an earthquake, I presume in Iran. Riki and Baki had planned to sell the mummy on the black market and split the profits. There was an immense amount of conflicting information on the mummy's asking price. One source said Riki tried to sell the mummy for $50 million, but only got $1 million. Another said Riki was offered $1.1 million, but declined that offer because he wanted more. Another said it was sold for $11 million, and yet another said it was on offer for $11 million when it was seized by police. Riki said in an interview that he received estimates that it was worth up to $1 billion. Yet another source said the asking price was $35 million. So I'm not entirely sure of the details surrounding the mummy's sale or asking price. But one thing was clear. This mummy was a highly valued commodity. After the mummy was found by police, it was taken to the National Museum in Karachi. The mummy had been placed inside an ornately carved wooden box, as well as a coffin. The mummy was of a woman who had only been about 4 foot 7 in life. She was covered in resin that had hardened into a shell, had her arms crossed and placed over her chest, and a gold plate over her chest. Like many mummies, she had also been wrapped in bandages. Drawings on the coffin were similar to those found in ancient Persia. And the coffin, wooden box, and breastplate were all covered in inscriptions. These inscriptions turned out to be cuneiform, an ancient system of writing that you might remember from history class. Asma Ibrahim, the National Museum's curator, taught herself to read cuneiform so she could translate the inscriptions. The translation she uncovered read roughly as follows. I am the daughter of the great King Xerxes. Mazarika, protect me. I am Radugana. I am. I could not figure out who Mazarika is. The only mentions I came across of the name were in articles about this story. But the name Xerxes is more familiar. Xerxes ruled the Persian Empire from 486 BC until his death in 465 BC. He was referenced in the Bible, albeit under a different name, and more recently, and possibly more notably, was a character in the movie 300, which was based on a real battle. Sort of. But if this was the body of a Persian princess, why had she been mummified? No mummies had ever been found in Pakistan or Iran. In fact, the only country thought to have mummified their dead, at least in that part of the world, was Egypt. And in my own research, which admittedly was limited to the internet, I couldn't find much evidence that Xerxes ever even had a daughter named Radugana. A BBC documentary on this case said she was a real person, but we just don't know much about her, or much of the Persian royal family in general. The only other mention I could find of her was on Wikipedia, not the most reliable source. 
The Wikipedia entry also had her name spelled differently and said she was the daughter of Mithridates, not Xerxes. An archaeologist named Ahmed Hassan Dani said the mummy might have actually been an Egyptian princess who was married to a Persian prince. That would explain why her body had been mummified like that of an Egyptian. He insisted the mummy had the telling signs of ritual mummification that were unique to the ancient Egyptians. The princess did have her organs removed, just like the ancient Egyptians. However, when the Egyptians removed the brain through the nose, one of the nose bones had to be broken in order for the brain to get out. That bone wasn't broken in the Persian princess. So, who was the Persian princess? Was she really a princess from an ancient empire? Was she an Egyptian who had somehow found her way into ancient Persia or vice versa? As it turned out, she was neither. In March 2000, before the Persian princess had even been found by police, Oscar White Muscarella, who worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, received pictures of the mummy. The pictures were sent by someone in New Jersey, along with a letter saying the mummy was originally from Iran, but brought to Pakistan years earlier. It also said the mummy was of the daughter of Xerxes, and the sender knew this because of translations of a cuneiform inscription on the breastplate. The sender asked if Muscarella slash the museum was interested in buying the mummy. They reportedly offered $11 million for it, and this might be where some of the earlier conflicting information came from about the mummy's asking price. Muscarella was suspicious, so he contacted a cuneiform expert who analyzed the transcription. This person believed the inscription was a forgery, probably made in the 1930s or later. Muscarella also found out that carbon dating showed the mummy's wooden coffin was only about 250 years old. Convinced that the mummy was a fake, he cut off contact with the potential seller. In November 2000, smugglers confessed they had found the mummy in Afghanistan, close to the Iran border, and brought it into Pakistan. In January 2001, the mummy was declared a fraud by Iran's Cultural Heritage Organization. In April 2001, Asma Ibrahim released an 11-page report that said the mummy was a fraud and might also be a murder victim. And this was a pretty elaborate fraud. It required multiple people, including a stonemason, an expert in Egyptian mummification, and someone who knew cuneiform, or could at least learn it, to write out and carve the inscriptions. It could have taken several years and thousands of dollars, though if the scheme had worked, it would turn a really good profit. In January 2001, an analysis on an earlier CT scan done on the mummy determined that the body belonged to a woman who was about 21 years old and had been mummified a couple of years before being found. The CT scan had also determined the woman may have died from a blow to the spine. Powder had replaced her organs that had been removed, and she was also beginning to decay. Now it was time for an autopsy. The first thing the coroner noticed when unwrapping the body was blonde hair. This later led to speculation that the woman was from an urban area of Pakistan. Interestingly, the rest of her hair was gray. Only the tips were blonde. This may be why some sources say she was actually closer to 50 when she died. I'm honestly not sure which one of these age estimates is correct. It was also determined that her cause of death had been a blow to the spine, but it couldn't be determined whether it was accidental or homicide. Some sources said she had a broken neck and actually died from that. So what exactly happened here? Who was this woman and how did she die and how did her body end up in this elaborate forgery? We don't know for sure, but there have been a few theories proposed over the years. The first theory is that her family sold her body willingly. They were either approached by smugglers or maybe sought them out and sold the body of their recently deceased loved one for extra money. 
They may or may not have known that her body would be used for illegal purposes. I like to believe this theory because it's a lot better than the other ones that we're going to go over. But just like those, there really isn't any evidence pointing toward it. The next theory is that her body was stolen by grave robbers. She may have been in a car accident, a fall, or even a building collapse that led to her death. Then grave robbers found her body shortly thereafter and used it because it was still fresh. There's something interesting about this theory and some earlier speculation that I'd like to point out. This area of the world is pretty warm and smugglers would have to work quickly, probably within a 24-hour window, to mummify the body before it started to decay. The woman was thought to have died about four years before she was found, but mummified only two years before she was found. It's possible that one of these estimates is inaccurate. Or maybe smugglers found her body in 1996 and were somehow and for some reason able to freeze it for two years before mummifying it. It's just one of the many things in this case that we don't know. The last theory is that the woman was a murder victim, killed for the intention of creating a forgery. If this is true, then the smugglers who made the forgery probably committed murder so they would be guaranteed a fresh body. There has been speculation that the woman had no family or was a social outcast, someone who wouldn't be missed. There has also been talk of a very complex system of crime in the area, and she might not be the only victim of a forgery like this. During the media whirlwind after the mummy's discovery, there was a lot of dispute over who actually owned the body. Pakistan said the body belonged to them because it was found there. Iran said it belonged to them because it was of a Persian princess, and ancient Persia is in modern-day Iran. This was obviously before the mummy was confirmed to be a forgery. Even the Taliban claimed the mummy, saying they had punished the smugglers who took the mummy out of Afghanistan. There's also been speculation that the National Museum wanted to keep the mummy for themselves because it would bring in much-needed revenue, but I'm not sure if this is true. At some point in 2001, the woman's body was taken to a mortuary in Karachi. She was set to be buried in 2005, but the burial was delayed by the proverbial red tape. One source did say she was buried in 2008, but I'm not sure how reliable that is. Today, the woman's coffin and bandages are at the National Museum. She has been buried since, but nobody is really sure where. They know the cemetery, but not the exact location. It's not uncommon for Islamic graves to have simple or no markings. If she was buried in the Islamic tradition as Ozma Ibrahim wanted, and as a lot of people in Pakistan, I'm sure, are, her grave could very well be unmarked. After the Persian princess was discovered, more fraudulent mummies have popped up on the black market. According to Oscar White Muscarella, most museums have some sort of forgeries on display. Some are displayed because they were donated by wealthy donors who the museum doesn't want to upset. Others were actually created by museums who couldn't acquire legitimate artifacts. So before we go, a couple more things. I will put links below for two documentaries on the case that I used as sources and that are both pretty interesting on their own. The first is a BBC special that aired in 2001 and that I mentioned earlier. The other is from a docu-series called X-Files History. That one is free if you have Amazon Prime. If not, then you can get it for pretty cheap. I also want to mention the book Keeping the Dead by Tess Gerritsen, known as The Keepsake in the United States. It's the seventh book in Gerritsen's Rizzoli and Isle series, which was later turned into a TV show that ran from 2010 to 2016. The book follows the two detectives as they track down a murder victim who was embalmed like a mummy and initially believed to be an ancient find until a bullet was found in their body. I have heard that the book was inspired by the Persian princess case. I don't know if this is true or not, but they are obviously pretty similar. 
So that's all I have for you today on the Persian princess. Unfortunately, I don't think this is a case that's going to be solved anytime soon. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's not even an open investigation. I wish I could end this on a happier note. I'm sorry. Hopefully the woman was sold by her family who needed money. It's still not that great, but it's better than her being a murder victim or having her grave robbed. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it. And for more dark content, I hope you'll consider subscribing and hitting the bell. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.